Hello, hi, and welcome to another episode of Wellness in the Workplace. My name is Mbali Mzinyane, and I am your host. Wellness in the Workplace is a podcast that aims to equip new and experienced professionals with the tools and insights to navigate challenging workplace dynamics. And on today's episode, we are continuing with our series, My Career Story, where we interview women from all walks of life. We talk to them about their career journey, how it is that they got to where they are today, some of the challenges that they have to overcome and also just what it means to build a healthy happy and sustainable career and on today's episode I have a woman that I've been admiring from afar in <laughs> studio <laughs> um, I have been looking at your profile on social media also happen to go to church with you so every now and then I yes, might girl. squeeze <laughs> a bit of a look here and there uh, her name is uh, Sibatle Sifogazi Magadla she is a development economist Economist who is addressing unemployment, inequality, and poverty across Africa. She's also a Shevening alumni as well as a One Young World ambassador. Recently ventured into career coaching, specifically career coaching for people who want to break into economics. Welcome to Wellness in the Workplace. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Amazing. As it. usual, impeccably dressed, Thank looking you. stunning. You're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> looking absolutely, Thank absolutely you so stunning. Much. How's it been being in South Africa, back in South Africa after a few weeks of traveling? Oh, for context, yes. I was in London for yes. a seminar training program for development economists amazing. and public policy practitioners. I had the most amazing time mm. learning. Now that I'm back, I'm just like, what do I do with everything that, that you I know? Tried? Yes, so yes. I'm feeling good, mm -hmm. but also the pressure is on to mm -hmm. just keep mm. the momentum going. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Before I ask you more details of about course. your travel adventure, your yeah. career, etc., um, it's always good to just set a bit of context as to who we are talking to. So, who is Usbahle? You know, what was your child childhood like, yeah. and uh, what? played a role in really the women that we are seeing today. Absolutely. So I am from Mtata, Eastern Cape. The Shout last, out to Eastern Cape. The last girl. So my dad had five girls mm -hmm. and I'm the last one. Mm -hmm. um, so I would grow up in a family where our dad really just like cared about his daughters, like upward, like economic mobility. Sure. This is in our education. He really wanted us to just thrive in whatever we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. The community I grew up in, though, was very much like, um, there was just a lot of poverty, inequality, a lot of teenage pregnancy, sure. a lot of people just feeling disillusioned because unemployment is just so rife. Mm. So I think from a young age, I was very conscious that like people around us are going through really hard things. Mm. And I think throughout my upbringing, that's when I just felt like, sure, Life is not just about having a good time. You mm. need to actually use what you have to make a difference. Mm. But I think something that really shifted my life is when my firstborn sister actually fell sick, ended sure. up in a public hospital. And, sure. had her. and I think seeing her go through that, like, not ideal environment, because when you're sick, you're quite vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just seeing the how the system is set up, how there's so many things that are not working, nurses are feeling overwhelmed because mm -hmm. they don't have everything they need mm -hmm. to actually like do their work. Doctors are also just like so exhausted. So I think when I saw that both through the lens of my sister, but sure. seeing other patients next to her needing more care, but not being able to get it because our healthcare system, our public healthcare system is not working well, mm -hmm. made me aware that guys, we need the right policies. We need the mm. right solutions to make sure that every South African, whether you're in the public, private space, mm. your human dignity sure. is maintained. Sure. So I think in a nutshell, who I am is very much shaped by what I've seen and trying to do work or live my life in a manner that plays a part in making things better. Sure, sure. Amazing, amazing. Um, I do believe that our personal experiences really do shape how we yeah. perceive ourselves and 100%. how we perceive the world, right? Um, and oftentimes it becomes the fuel yeah. behind our passion and the work that we do. So um, beautiful, beautiful story there. Mm -hmm. But why not healthcare then after seeing all of that? Why not Such something else in public sector and 
and yeah. you ended up being a development economist. And also, how did you even find out about yeah. economics <laughs> and that specific that kind specific of way, economics? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was initially, so uh, unfortunately, my sister eventually passed away. Sure. So we had to go through that grieving period. So I wanted to be a doctor after mm. that. But what I noticed that every time I go to hospitals, I get so emotional. Sure. Like, I was just sure. like, hmm. So I was like, hmm, how do I address this health thing from a different angle? So when I was in matric, I learned about actuarial science. And uh, so they deal with a lot of like insurance products. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm -hmm. I want to make sure we have micro insurance products. So those sure. are products that like even low income households can access yes. in order for better health care. So I registered actually at the University of Cape Town sure. to do actuarial science. But when I got there and I looked at the courses, I was just like, hmm, this is actually <laughs> not for me. Yeah. So what yeah. happened is that in first year, mm. you have to do economics as one of your kind of like course electives okay. in okay. the actuarial science program. Yeah. I find my, found myself really being excited about. So basically what economics is, is right, is trying to maximize resources mm -hmm. under scarcity, right? Sure. So the whole thing is that given the resources we have, how do we actually make the most of them so there's a fair and sufficient allocation to whatever entities yes, might be? Yes. So I thought about it. I was like, okay, if we're thinking about, say, public resources or what's available in society, what's the best way to actually allocate things to make sure that everyone is included? Mm. So that's how I then ended up in this development economic stream where I was sure. like, okay, I want to use economic tools mm. to make sure that whatever resources exist, mm -hmm. we make sure that it's inclusive and actually addresses the ills that I'd mentioned before of poverty and inequality. Sure, sure, sure. So that's, I think, really great context for somebody mm. who really does know what economics is, right, and what it's about. Um, but at a more practical level, yes. on a day-to-day -day basis, yes. what does a day in the life of an economist really look like besides yeah. the traveling? You know, because everyone just says, oh, I want to be an economist, I just want to travel. Yes. <laughs> so, so first of all, to give context, if you if you study economics, you can be a lot of things, right? Sure. You can work for a bank sure. and be in the finance space and look at like the markets and how things work. Mm. You could be an academic and decide to actually go teach economics at a university. Mm -hmm. You can work for international development organizations mm -hmm. like the African Union and kind of be involved in those things. I chose a different path. So I chose to consult for different organizations. Sure. So I consult for the International Finance Corporation, which is part of mm. the World Bank Group. And I basically monitor and evaluate all the development projects that they're trying to sure. do. So for example, if they're saying we're going to allocate X amount of money to provide micro loans to women entrepreneurs sure. in Kenya. Sure. I'm part of the team that actually evaluates who are these loans going to are they actually being supported by these loans? Mm. What are the outcomes? Are the business mm. growing? Is the is the woman able to sell more of the clothes that she's designed? Mm. Does she have access mm. to more markets? Mm. Is her network bigger? Sure. So I actually evaluate to see is the impact. Sure. Right. We said sure. we want to promote women's entrepreneurship on the continent. Mm -hmm. Is it actually really happening? Mm. So that's development. So that's one ambit that I I do for the IFC. Then I also consult for government. I've done a bit of work with the Department of Employment and Labor mm -hmm. trying to address the issue of lack of jobs. Sure, so to sure. put it in in the most simple terms, mm -hmm. the biggest issue in South Africa is that we have a growing labor force, i.e. young people, or mm. even older people who are looking for jobs, mm -hmm. but the skills that they have do not match what, what is, is being needed. demanded yeah. by the jobs that are available. Mm. And this mismatch, there's many things. Education is the rural-urban divide. Sure, sure. And also just lack of information. Sure. A graduate has graduated, has the skills, but has no clue mm. where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. So part of the work that I do in my consulting and development is to form those links, right? Sure, to say, sure. this department is looking, sure. this department is trying to do this to promote labor. Mm. Let's coordinate the mm. existing existing entities to make sure there's an ecosystem that actually sure, works sure, right sure. so that's what i do and then on the side i also support other like uh, think tanks development think tanks that i say trying to promote women's like outcomes say mm. if you know more women's rights if they need someone with the economic skills to bring in more like 
ideas or advisory on how they can be more efficient mm -hmm. in the work that they're doing, mm. I would provide that technically. But before you then carved out the specific yes. niche of being able to play a social impact role to some extent yes. in different sectors, uh -huh. um, in different entities, yeah. let's go back to your first work experience. Girl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to yeah. that work experience. How was it like transitioning from mm. student life and straight into corporate? Mm. Um, and also, how did you acclimatize to yeah. corporate culture and just navigating this big world yeah. that you had not previously been exposed to? 100%. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll share you two things. So, I was lucky enough with my first job. I just finished my honors in economics mm -hmm. at the University of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. So, when you do your honors, you have to do a research research write a research paper okay so my supervisor who's a lecturer is also a director of like one of the top research units in africa amazing so he took me in and i was lucky enough to get the kind of mentorship to be good in mm. that space mm. but because it was more of an academic environment mm -hmm. it wasn't as corporate like right? sure sure but fast forward a couple of years later mm -hmm. i do land an extremely corporate job sure. with an american firm sure. that had an office in johannesburg mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you can imagine number one american culture is very capitalistic yeah. it's like how yeah. much did you deliver? Results driven. Did yeah. you work minimum eight <laughs> hours a yeah, day? Yeah. And you have to enter your time. There's a time oh, sheet. Goodness. So you need to say from uh, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. I did this. But mm. you need to provide a narrative of exactly what you sure, did. Sure. So that you kind of are accountable for every hour yes, of the day. Yes. So A, that was an adjustment. Because yes. then you're like, yes. okay, let's work. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, navigating corporate was hard. Because in my head... I just thought all you needed to do is to be smart enough and deliver the slide deck yes. or the Excel spreadsheet. Yes. But I wasn't sensitive to the more nuanced things such mm -hmm. as how do you engage in a meeting? Mm -hmm. How do you respond to your manager? Mm -hmm. How do you manage upwards? Or even before they ask you for things, you're already the one saying, okay, I'm done with this. Is there anything sure, else? Sure. How do I actually make um, peers within the organization? Yes, yes. It's almost like this game that like, your schooling might not equip you for because yeah. schooling provides you with the more technical yes. things. But the work skills. was a major adjustment mm. in terms of, and now it's also multicultural. So mm. what's normal to a South African in terms of engaging with peers, sure. how they move is different. Mm. So even like mm. knowing how, what to say, am I like, is this political correct in yes, the group setting? Yes. Or should I wait to actually have this discussion one sure. on one with this person? Those are cues that like, I didn't necessarily have, mm. and I had to learn the hard way. Sure. Like, so the lessons learned were learned with a lot of consequences sure. that were very hard on my end. And mm. I'm sure we'll get back into this later, but I think those lessons are what formed my desire to do the coaching thing yes, so that yes. younger people don't go through what I went through. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So then during that time, mm. I can imagine that there is somewhat a state of confusion, Absolutely. a state of anxiety, hypervigilance, you know. Absolutely. So how are you managing, just navigating that, going back to the mentorship that you had in your first role, your yes. previous role, to now where you're almost thrown in the deep end, right? Literally. To figure things out Literally. on your own. Literally. How are you coming up for air? My goodness, I won't lie. It was really hard because mm. what even happened is that in the beginning, I did try to reach out with one of the MD to one of the MDs yes. to be a mentor. Yes. But a few months later, he got headhunted by the World Bank. He left. Mm. So I was left out and dry. Like, sure. you know, when you just feel so bad. So I won't <laughs> lie. Every morning I was yeah. miserable. Like, yeah. I got out of bed every mm. morning with just this deep, deep. Oh anxiety so what i started to do is that i started to talking to to my friends who who were who had been in management consulting mm. had been in similar environments mm. and i think what helps that they affirm the fact that what i'm going through they they actually yeah. went through as well so because mm. you start asking yourself is something is wrong just, with me yeah is it just me? are other people feeling mm. this right mm. and i think mm. because i was working like most of my colleagues were you know from the uk mm. europe i find that those cultures are very private so yes. they, they won't share that they're actually struggling yes. so yes. whenever i try to raise it with my peers like are you feeling what i'm feeling mm. they would just 
be quiet you understand <laughs> so yeah. when i spoke to yeah. other peers here in south africa yes. with other consulting firms yes. they kind of then started to mm. give me tips mm. uh, then i reached out to a mentor i had had when i was doing my masters in london mm. and i was like look i actually need your help sure and he just broke it down for me and he yeah. so he's nigerian but grew up um in the uk mm. so he's had to like navigate the very multicultural yes. diverse environment and yes. how like it's literally like you need to learn mm -hmm. how to navigate that environment it's not just like sure. something you you you, you go wake into up and, and you do and you wing, yeah. you wing so by the end of it i managed to kind of recover um and actually do well mm. um but i think by that time when things were going well i had so much more perspective and mm. more questions about like is this the environment I actually sure. thrive best in? Sure. Is this w what I want? Sure. Is this the environment that helps me get the most impact that sure. I said I want to have when sure. I was younger, given my experiences? So I had to kind of like let that season yeah. of my life go yeah. to actually walk into what is really aligned with my true passion. Yeah, yeah. Mm. How long were you in that space for? I was in that space for two years and it okay. felt like the longest two years yeah. of my life. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm grateful for the lessons, but... I think it was the one of the hardest times of my life. Mm. Like it was every day was hard. Sure, weekends were hard because sure. you were working. Yeah, and you know it, it, you can get a call anytime. Like, oh my goodness, do you understand? Yeah. Like, I still have anxiety yeah. from that Microsoft <laughs> team call. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm very yeah. grateful that it's behind me. But I do want to encourage that, like any other young people who are going through this, like your feelings are normal. And if you can get the mentorship and support that you need to navigate that space as best as you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%, yeah. 100%. So you briefly touched on mm. you having doing having to do your master's yes. in London. Correct. Um, I do want to talk a bit more about the international exposure that you got quite mm. early on in your career yes. and what impact that uh, exposure really had mm. in how you approach your mm. career now and how you're building out your career and solidifying your space in development economics 100 percent. so um so my first real international exposure actually happened when i was at uct okay there was a program called the south africa washington international program okay so during the june july holidays yes. right they take students from U uct uwc up mm -hmm. for a six week like internship or work exposure opportunity in washington mm -hmm. dc mm -hmm. so that was my first time Amazing. like getting to work like in dc like you know like it, we were literally in the hustle and yes, bustle we yes. had to learn how to dress professional dress code one sure your shoes, you know what i mean sure. like it was a very good time and i think from there that's when i was like hmm i feel like i want more than mm. just like essay exposure sure so anyway i think i told you that my first job i had the great mentorship from the professor who owns yes, the research unit yes. so a lot of the projects that he would put us on were on the continent amazing so i remember my first work trip was to uganda mm -hmm. and we're trying to understand how labor markets work so in uganda no most people don't work just one job mm -hmm. so someone will work in their like uh, farm like on their land in the morning mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon they'll go to town and go sell their produce sure. you know what i mean sure. so we were trying to rethink the way we talk about what is your job mm -hmm. that like people don't just have one job mm -hmm. it's more nuanced than that yeah depending on where you are yeah so i think that's when i was like oh my gosh there's such a big world out of south africa that i can actually gain lessons from outside of africa south africa and bring them yes, back yes. so i think that's where the thirst now just started getting greater and greater mm. so for me Africa travels an opportunity to learn mm. and actually gain more pan-African ideas sure, sure. or thinking mm -hmm. about how to drive development here within mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing, amazing. Let's yeah. talk about though spending time abroad. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody really listening or watching yeah. who may have aspirations to do that, right? Mm. Um, you went to the UK Correct. via Shevening, um, which is a very prestigious mm. uh, scholarship program. Mm. And that opens you up to a world of opportunities mm. and networks, et cetera. So, much. so that experience, what was that like? Let's just start with firstly, 
I mean, you completed your master's yes. <laughs> in South Africa. Yes. And then you decided, hmm, I think I want another master's. <laughs> Let <laughs> me go abroad. <laughs> so interesting enough, what happened was yeah. I actually started the master's at UCT. Okay. And I got the email okay. that you have an interview for Shevening. Okay. So I actually oh, left, that's how it's pronounced. Yes, Shevening. Okay. So I left my master's, UCT master's halfway, went to London, then yes, came back to finish to complete off. it. Okay, so yeah. you weren't doing both of them concurrently. Yeah, okay. no, 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 okay. I took, I took okay. a pause. So All anyway, right. the Shivening Scholarship is a leadership scholarship, mm-hmm. right? And it's meant to promote the next generation of leaders who address development challenges in their countries. Mm-hmm. And I want to disclaim this, guys, that when I applied for the master's, mm-hmm. I had reservations because I didn't have the best marks. Okay. Right? So that was the first okay. thing. Because, I mean, coming from MTATA, the transition to UCT, yes. it was a big culture shock. Yeah. The world culture. So my first and second year were a mess. Okay. Right? Okay. I eventually kind of recovered. Yes. But, like, I also had my reservations. So this is just to say that if you have a bit of, like, concerns about do I qualify or not, chances are you belong there if you're passionate about what you're doing. Sure. So anyway, sure. <laughs> I applied for the scholarship. I got mm. through the interview stage. Then I went away. Um, and it was the best experience of my life. Mm. Yes, I went to an amazing school, the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Mm-hmm. So I got to learn about new ways of, you know, addressing development challenges sure, from sure. the context of a country. Because guys, to be honest, the way we think of economics and development we can't do it the same way the US or Europe does it. Of course. It of needs course. to be very pan African. Yeah. Because we have yeah. a history of colonialism architect in South Africa. So when we think about like restoring what belongs to people who sure. were kind of disenfranchised, we cannot do it the way the West did it. Sure. So so as was a great experience in that regard because I got to learn about economic history, the political settlement of a country mm-hmm. and coming up with uh, development solutions that are actually relevant. suitable mm-hmm. and relevant for that mm-hmm. space. Now, the beauty of Shimming is that they really capitalize on networking. So when we're there, they would send us, go. you can go to this event, you can travel here, you can go, s- and they'd sponsor, you know, most of these opportunities. So they'd even teach you that, like, when you go to this event, this is what you should say, sure. this is how you should present yourself. Sure. So you kind of learn how to make connections, but for purpose. So mm. it's not just to say, hi, I'm this person, you go home. But you're quite, like, thoughtful about, like, if I make this connection, what could I potentially do with this partnership or with this thing in the future, mm-hmm. right? So I think that opened up my mind that, like, when we think of partnerships and collaboration for good, mm-hmm. don't limit yourself to where you are. Sure. You could meet someone in London, meet someone in the U.S. who's like-minded, and you can put your heads and resources together to start a project, to drive something that will actually have impact. So the UK was a wonderful time. I highly recommend it. Mm. And literally all the, most of the people that I coach, mm-hmm. I'm always pressing, go and study. <laughs> go. It yeah. will really open yeah. up your world. I love that. I love that so much. Speaking of your coaching services, uh-huh. you recently launched that. Yes. Um, specifically for young professionals who yes. want to build a career in economics. But yes. I assume that it would be, um, relevant for really any young professional actually, in any yeah. field as well, right? Yeah, um, what was the inspiration mm. outside of obviously your personal experience yes. that you previously shared? What was the inspiration to really um, start this? Mm. And what tools do you think career coaching gives young professionals that can help them and set them up for success? Mm, absolutely. So... I, so after I, my time ended at the consulting firm, I was speaking about the two years, right? Mm-hmm. I decided then that I'm kind of ready to actually follow my true north sure. and to actually do work in impact and development. But I didn't know where to start. I didn't mm. know. I, I mean, I, I've told you now all the nice, the interesting things I do, but like I didn't know yeah. where I was going to start. So I actually w- started working with a career coach, a lady called Amanda that I met in Kenya. Sure. Uh, during my travels, because I travel mm-hmm. so much. Mm-hmm. So she actually started supporting me to help me kind of like pursue work that is aligned with my passion, my skills, but also my general interests. Mm. So when I went through that journey with her and opportunities starting, started opening up, mm. right? I was like, I want to pay this 
forward, mm. right? But focusing on economics, because economics is so nuanced. Like, if you're an economist, you could do anything. Mm-hmm. You could go in consulting, development, mm. investment banking, mm. you start an NGO. Like, there's so many things. So I find that a lot of people who go through that stream are confused. And yes. then what happens is that they just settle for whatever job that they get. Sure. It might not sure. necessarily be aligned with what they really want to do. They get stuck because they get promotion to promotion to promotion. Mm. But deep down, it's they know they that it's not who they are. Mm. So mm. I think in mm. terms of the benefits of coaching, yes, I'll give you the skills on like how to make sure your CV looks good, interview skills, how to negotiate for a salary you deserve. Mm. Like we go through those more practical mm. things. But my coaching is more like the inner work. Yes. Who are you? Yes. What is the mark that you want to make in the world? Yes. What are the blockages or limiting beliefs or fears you need to overcome to go there? What are the past traumas you actually need to work through that you need to actually realize that I can actually do this? Why are you delaying this? So it's a lot of like inner work. So over and above the more practical things about like being good at corporate and so on and so forth, I'm very much focused on actually like looking within to make sure that whatever you are doing is aligned with your true north. And I also want to highlight that most people feel like you're you're doing the right thing only if you're like an entrepreneur mm. or doing impact work. Mm. But even if you are in that consulting from what they inv- in that investment bank, if there's a clear purpose and growth path regarding what you want to learn, what you want to gain from it, what you want to contribute before you move into the next season of your career journey. I support you with that as well. So I think the the the, the key part is that I really help my clients crystallize mm-hmm. what they want to do, the mark they want to make in the world, and what the steps they would kind of need to pursue to get there. Sure. Once they've done the Sure, work. sure. Uh, that's quite comprehensive. It is. And it's, and it's very <laughs> important work, right? Yes. Um, I think you, you spoke about something that I'm kind of, um, mm. I don't want to say grappling with. Sure, sure. <laughs> but maybe on the other side of the grappling, yes. right? Just reconciling that sometimes you are living within a template that yeah. was predetermined for you, right? 100%. And you realize along the way when you start having questions around, yes. am I fulfilled? Is this really what I want? Is this how I'm going to exactly. live out my story and my purpose exactly. in this world? And I think we become so focused on just getting that job, getting that mm-hmm. promotion, financial security, Absolutely. that we we kind of overlook those important questions right. and the inner work. So I really, really like that, you know, you force your clients to just take a pause and yeah. to do a self audit and, and reflect, mm. you know, so introspect important. and reconcile what needs to be reconciled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that you are also best positioned to go after the things that will add value, not only to you, but to the world around you. So absolutely, absolutely love, love, love your approach, Thank by the way. You. <laughs> Thank you um, so, much. so for anyone then that is looking for a career coach what do you think are the three things that they should prioritize in a coach? Sure. So I think, and, and interesting enough, this is a question that I, I, I always ask potential clients. Because yes. I first do like a 15-minute intro call just yes. to say, okay, let's chat. What do you want? What mm-hmm. are you looking for? And most of them won't be like clear on what they want, but they'll kind of like, share the problem. Yes. This is the problem. This yes. is what I'm going through. This, yes. is, this is what I need, mm. right? Then based on that, I kind of come back to say, these are the ways that I can potentially help you. Mm-hmm. So I think the first thing, definitely, as you think of who you want to support you, make sure that whatever they're saying they're going to do with you or proposing, kind of like, it's almost like a hard, more of like a, hmm, this resonates. Mm. Does this resonate? Mm. What they're saying they're going to take me through, does this resonate? Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing. Mm. Number two, and this might sound controversial, but you also want your coach to be someone, when you look at their life and what they're doing, it's not about how successful or rich they are, but when you look at their life, the fruits of their life, so it could be what they say on LinkedIn, social media and stuff, is it aligned? Is it Mm. like almost like energetically a match? then you want to go with that person, okay? Mm-hmm. And I think the final thing, and probably one would only be able to, 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 to suss this out after, say, after the first session, is to actually suss out, like, 
how do I feel with this person? Can I feel vulnerable with this coach? Because coaching is a very vulnerable thing. We we talk about really deep things. It's not just surface level, oh, your CV, da, 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 da. We go to really hard places. Mm. So I think you also want to have someone that you can be vulnerable with and mm -hmm. know that it's a safe space. Yes, we're talking about a career, but like this is a soft landing for me to have conversation. And speaking of uh, your clients, what mm. do you think are some of the common challenges that they face yeah. when they come to you and they say, oh my God, I have an issue. Um, I need your help. Sure. What are the common challenges sure, it is absolutely. that they face? Yeah. yeah. So for the younger guys or so the graduates, it's more like I have no idea what I'm going to do after I graduate. Sure. I have the degree, but I have no clue where I'm going. Mm. So that's a big one. Mm. And I think I mentioned already that with economics specifically, there's just so many streams, right? Mm. Then you have your very like successful young professionals who studied economics but are not doing work related at all to ecos. Sure. So they're like, look, I've created this life. I'm getting promotions. I'm in management. I'm in what, what. Mm. But it's not the true thing that I want to do. How do I pivot back into ecos but still continue in terms of like if, if maybe I'm at manager level, still pivot in a manner that allows me to still go up in that way. Mm -hmm. Then you have like, some of my clients are older than me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they just feel like maybe seasons change, they marry, they have children, so they kind of want to rethink the way they navigate work. So maybe instead of working full-time, they want to do more for part-time, contract work, stint, right? So I support them uh, with that. And then interestingly, I have a lot of clients who want to kind of fly solo and go into entrepreneurship but they don't know how to network, where to go, how to start. So those are the kind of like challenges that people are having. Um, and I think the, the one key thing that, that is very much tied with the key thread there is that people are wanting to do work that is aligned with their calling, with their purpose, with the mark that they want to make in the world, sure. with their lives. Sure. That's the key thing. So it's, it's almost like a... Help me to get back to my true north. Sure. Help me to get back to my, my, my true north. But how it manifests then would look different depending on what stage or level that that specific client is at. In their so in closing for this part of the conversation, sure. what advice would you then give to anybody looking to pivot into economics mm. um, without any experience? Yeah. Is it possible? Is it feasible? Um, and if you are now in a position where you do have the experience or rather the academic background, yeah. but don't have the experience, how do you shift? Absolutely. That's a great question. Firstly, nothing is impossible. That's one thing. I always yes. Say. Nothing <laughs> is impossible. Yeah. Um, and I think economics is very interesting because you can decide to uh, go back to school and study or you can just decide to read all the relevant books and information, right? Mm. And start writing. So start a blog, writing on economic material, and kind of call yourself an economist. So, so it's very interesting how people choose to kind of work in that way. Mm. But I think for me, the first question you need to ask is, what is the kind of work I want to do as an economist? You don't have to like know what company or what organization, mm -hmm. but like, think about if I rise in the morning and I'm calling myself an economist, this is the kind of work that I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. So once you have that, then you can even start to look at people who are doing exactly that, what you outlined, and see how they manage to do that. So what did they study? Who do they know? Where do they go? What courses have they taken? Mm -hmm. And then if you can... Get a career coach to help you pivot. Well, thank you so much You're for so just uh, right. that insight. Yeah. I think there was good, um, just reflective points, right? Mm. Uh, because we went mm. to a place that I didn't think we'd go. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, especially around the inner work and ah. finding your true north. And I think okay. that's such an important it's thing critical. that people typically overlook when you have mm. career discussions. Mm. It's really just about how do I navigate this yeah. game? Like, how do I come out on top of yeah. this game? And sometimes to the point of sacrificing yourself, mm. uh, which you is not see, sustainable. Not, not sustainable at all. It's yeah, not. Yeah. 
All right. My favorite part of uh, the interview where we okay. ask uh, bonus questions. Okay. Um, the little secret is that when I do ask uh, my podcast guests about what their favorite <laughs> book, article, yeah. or podcast mm. that has helped them, yeah. um, you know, change their perspective about how they approach work. I'm actually doing it for myself oh, <laughs> because <okay. laughs> I want to read up on some of the I things like that. that, you know, that my guests also read up on or listen mm -hmm. to. So, so yeah, I hope, um, you know, the listeners or anybody watching also finds this valuable. Yes. So with that being said, what podcast, video, book or article have you listened to or read that has shifted your perspective about work? Amazing. Mm. So one book of go-to for me is Intelligence Is Not Enough by oh. Therese Anderson. Our last guest said the same Honestly, thing. Honestly, that <laughs> book did it for me. And I read it whilst yes. I was going through the thick of things yes. and that job. Yes. But I think for me, w l let me actually say why. I think for mm. me, the biggest take-home point was that like it's not about how good you are at like delivering the work. It's also about how you foster relationships, sure, sure. how you show up. And I think that book is really, really amazing mm. at that. Mm -hmm. But I want to share a second one since someone already shared that. Shared. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if you know the former... Um, she was a former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. Okay. Uh, Indra Noy. Okay. An Indian woman. Yes, but yes, grew yes, up in her. Grew up uh, in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she ended up going through that growth path and kind of like thriving in an environment that was not designed for her to sure, thrive. Sure. But I love how she talks about, obviously there's a resilience, there's a persistence, but just like how she managed to work through really hard seasons, mm -hmm. how she managed to like still stay married. And I mean, mm. for women, you're married, mm. you have kids mm -hmm. navigating that. I just feel like it, it's such an honest take sure. on the give and take sure. that and it entails it mm. to be that kind of woman. And I feel like a lot of women who watch this podcast or even men, mm. anyone in general mm. is the kind of person who wants to make a mark in the world. Sure. And I feel like that book really shows that like, to really be a change maker, to shift the needle, takes sacrifice. But there's grace to do it if you approach it strategically. So I think Indra's book for me was just sure, like... Sure, sure. What's the title of the book? No, it's just Indra Noi. Like, Indra, yeah. Okay. If, if, if I've forgotten the title, just look at Indra Noi. Title. Yeah, Indra Noi. <laughs> literally, <laughs> listen. Yeah, yeah. Every time okay, I, I think okay. I, I think about it, I'm just like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen a couple of clips of her oh, um, on social, her but haven't really like gone into her work and her, her journey so definitely a to-do list of i highly to recommend <laughs> I put that book yeah down. She was, she's just so raw, raw. and honest and, and i like that need, she didn't sugarcoat right? that's the hard days i mean she shares one a situation with like she was so exhausted after a long day of work and mm. she, had a, she had an accident like she bumped like so I, for me it was such a you like most people won't tell you that. Yeah. I would say I had a smooth journey. I made yes, it to CEO. I'm yes, flying first class yes. business class as a private jet for me. Yes. She put in the work. Love that. Um, I love that. But she was very purposeful about yes. it. Like it's also like it wasn't just that I just want the title. She mm. was very much purposeful mm. about like making a contribution mm -hmm. to the organization. Sure. So. Love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Please. Definitely must read. Okay. Mm. Then last question, actually. I almost said second last yeah. question, but it's sure. the final question. Mm -hmm. What does wellness in the workplace look like for you? Mm. Mm. So I think for me, wellness in the workplace, right, is about intentionality. So whatever job you're in, whether you're in that job that requires you to work 60 hours a week, Oh, you're in a more flexible job that allows you to like have more time for this and this. It's 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 a the why. Why are you doing this? What are you building? What is the why behind it? So for some people, you're working sixty to eighty hours because there's something you're working mm -hmm. towards, right? Mm -hmm. For someone else, you're doing the flexible thing because you want to create more room for say doing other things, showing up for your family. So sure. it's a different season of your life. So I think for me, wellness is knowing that like. I'm doing this work in this way in this season because it's the best way for me. It's the best way I, I, I can show up in the season of my life. Mm -hmm. So it's really being into when you rise every morning, just like, okay, this is how I'm feeling about work. Really start to think, why am I feeling like this? Is it valid for the season that I'm in? And could I be more intentional about making it better? Or does it serve its purpose in this current season? So, and I think that's important because what people start doing is that they compare 
themselves and say, oh, but this one is doing this, earning this, doing that. But I think for me, it's like, am I being intentional and making sure that I'm showing up the best I can in that season that I'm in? So that's what wellness looks like for me. Sure. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Closing remarks. Where can we find out more about you and the work that you do, uh, specifically your career coaching services? How sure. can we get in contact with you? Absolutely. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Swatle Magadla, or drop me an email on APIS Magadla at gmail.com. I'm also on Instagram, Siba Sela. You can just say hi, drop me a DM, and we can chat. Amazing. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Looking oh, wow. stunning as always. Oh, and you. just the many, many reflective points uh, that you've shared on this episode. Awesome. I think this is one that I'm also going to listen to for myself and not just to, Yay. you know, evaluate <laughs> the quality Yay. of the podcast. Yay. So, yeah, mm. thank you so much. And to you, if you are listening, if you're watching, thank you so much for tuning in just for your consistent and constant support for the podcast. We hope you've been enjoying uh, this series titled Hashtag My Career Story. And I hope that you're taking notes so that you can carve out your own career story with intention, with purpose, and with a sustainable end goal in mind. My name is Mbalim Zinyane. This is Wellness in the Workplace. I will see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.